In the ancient lands of biblical Israel, where power and prophecy clashed, a queen's thirst for dominion led to unimaginable betrayal and bloodshed. Athaliah, the ruthless queen who defied divine order, seized the throne of Judah through cunning and carnage, plunging the royal house of David into chaos. But what drove this woman to annihilate her own lineage to claim the crown? And how did a daring act of faith and rebellion overturn her reign? In this gripping tale of ambition, treachery and divine justice, we uncover shocking revelations of temple desecration, secret uprisings, and a daring rescue that changed the fate of a kingdom forever. Stay tuned as we delve into the dramatic rise and fall of Athaliah, the queen who dared to challenge both man and God. Athaliah was a queen of Judah, a woman of royal lineage but infamous for her cruelty and ambition. She was the daughter of Jezebel, the notorious queen of Israel and Ahab, her husband. Jezebel's legacy of idolatry and violence lived on through Athaliah, but the daughter took her mother's wickedness to even darker depths. When her son, King Ahaziah of Judah, died, Athaliah seized the opportunity to claim power for herself. Her ambition knew no bounds and her actions shocked the nation. In an unprecedented act of brutality, Athaliah ordered the massacre of all the surviving members of the House of David, her own family. This was no ordinary power grab, it was a calculated extermination of anyone who might challenge her rule. Only one child, a baby named Josh, escaped her murderous reach. His life was spared, thanks to the courage and quick thinking of Jehoshaphat, the wife of the high priest Jehoiada. Jehoshaphat secretly took Josh and hid him in the temple, shielding him from his grandmother's wrath. Athaliah's reign was marked by a zealous commitment to the worship of Baal, the pagan god of her mother's homeland. She erected an altar to Baal in Jerusalem, complete with idols, sacred pillars, and a priesthood led by a man named Mutton. Yet, even in her audacity, Athaliah hesitated to desecrate the Temple of Solomon itself. Instead, she forbade its use for worship and placed foreign mercenaries and royal guards to block access, ensuring that the people could not gather there. For six years, Athaliah ruled with an iron fist. Her influence reached deep into the nation's political and religious life, and the people seemed paralyzed by fear. Even the high priest Jehoiada, a staunch supporter of the House of David and a keeper of Judah's ancient traditions, appeared powerless to act against her tyranny, at least for a time. Athaliah's rule was a dark chapter for Judah, one that saw the near destruction of the Davidic lineage, the suppression of the worship of the true God, and the flourishing of idolatry. Yet, beneath the surface, forces loyal to the House of David were quietly waiting and watching, holding fast to the promise of their ancestral covenant. When Athaliah sought to destroy the House of David in a bid to secure her power, she underestimated the courage and loyalty of Jehoshaphat, her own stepdaughter. Jehoshaphat, a woman of great bravery, risked her life to save Josh, the youngest son of her brother Ahaziah. Snatching the infant from the slaughter, she and his nurse hid him in a chamber within the temple, a place Athaliah dared not disturb. There, Josh grew under the watchful care of Jehoshaphat and her husband, Jehoiada, the high priest. For six years, Athaliah ruled Jerusalem with unchecked authority, oblivious to the secret being kept in the heart of the temple. During this time, Jehoiada worked quietly yet diligently, building alliances among the royal guards and mercenary troops. He revealed to them the existence of Josh, the rightful heir, and their loyalty to the house of David ignited. When Josh turned seven, Jehoiada decided the time had come to restore the true king to the throne. On a Sabbath day the plan unfolded. The temple guards, loyal to Jehoiada, took their positions, swords drawn, securing the sacred space. In a moment of breathtaking drama, Jehoiada brought Josh into the temple courts. The boy, crowned and anointed, was presented as the king of Judah. Trumpets sounded, weapons clashed, and the people erupted in a thunderous cry, Long live King Josh! The celebrations reached the ears of Athaliah in her palace, shattering her illusion of security. Rushing to the temple, she was confronted with the sight of Josh enthroned, surrounded by the guards and a jubilant crowd. Realizing her betrayal, she tore her clothes and screamed, Conspiracy, conspiracy! But her cries fell on deaf ears. Jehoiada's forces seized her, ensuring she was led outside the temple grounds to avoid desecrating the holy place. There, at the gates of the palace, Athaliah met her end, a fitting conclusion to her reign of terror. With Athaliah gone, Jehoiada turned the nation's focus to a spiritual renewal. Seizing the moment of unity and joy, he led Josh and the people in making a solemn covenant with God. They vowed to serve him faithfully and to cast off idolatry. Together, they stormed the temple of Baal, 
tearing down its altars and crushing its idols. The priests of Baal, powerless and reviled, faced the wrath of the people. The restoration was complete. Josh was escorted to the royal palace amidst a triumphant procession, where he was placed on the throne of his ancestors. Jerusalem, once oppressed under Athaliah's tyranny, was now alive with hope and renewed devotion. The people, inspired by Jehoiada's leadership, rallied around their young king, determined to uphold their covenant and the legacy of the House of David. While dramatic revolutions unfolded in Samaria and Jerusalem, one figure remained strikingly absent, the prophet Elisha. Though his master, Elijah, had been a fiery, confrontational leader, Elisha chose a quieter path, focusing on teaching and nurturing the prophetic schools that Elijah had established. His presence was less polarizing though no less profound. Unlike Elijah who lived in solitude, Elisha made his home in Samaria, engaging directly with the people. Yet Elisha never set foot in Jerusalem, and the records are silent on any relations he may have had with Judah. This absence likely stemmed from tensions between prophetic traditions and the priestly order in the city. Elijah's dramatic sacrifices on Mount Carmel, though in the name of Israel's God, had clashed with the centralized worship dictated by the Jerusalem temple. The priesthood, especially under Jehoiada who adhered strictly to the law, might have viewed Elisha's methods with suspicion. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the aftermath of Athaliah's reign left the temple in disrepair. The sanctuary bore the scars of her idolatrous rule, its treasures likely looted and its structure damaged. As one of his first royal acts, young King Josh, under Jehoiada's guidance, set out to restore the temple. However, funding this endeavor posed a challenge. The priests initially attempted to collect contributions, but progress was slow, either due to insufficient funds or possible misuse of resources. Josh, with Jehoiada's support, devised a new plan. A chest with a slit was placed in the temple courtyard, allowing individuals to give freely as they felt moved. This system proved effective with generous offerings pouring in from the people. The funds were used to hire skilled carpenters and masons and to procure the necessary materials, enabling the long overdue restoration. Jehoiada's role extended beyond the physical rebuilding of the temple. His influence elevated the office of high priest to a status equal to that of the king, a significant shift in Judah's governance. After all, Jehoiada had orchestrated the overthrow of Athaliah, preserved the Davidic line, and restored Judah's covenant with God. His authority ensured that the nation adhered to the law, preventing a relapse into idolatry. This delicate balance between royal power and priestly authority persisted throughout Jehoiada's life. Josh, indebted to the high priest for his throne and guidance, showed deference, even granting Jehoiada the extraordinary honor of burial in the royal tomb upon his death. However, the seeds of future tension were sown. Royal authority, often shaped by the king's personal disposition, would inevitably clash with the priesthood, which drew its strength from the immutable law. For now though, Judah flourished under the shared leadership of Josh and Jehoiada, a rare period of harmony between crown and clergy. After Jehoiada's death, the harmony that had defined his leadership unraveled. Josh, the once grateful king, found himself at odds with Jehoiada's son and successor, Zechariah. Though the details are sparse, the tension between the king and the high priest culminated in tragedy. Under Josh's orders, princes of Judah stoned Zechariah in the very temple courts. As the young priest lay dying, his final words resounded with prophetic weight, May God take account of this and avenge it. This act not only shattered the bond between monarchy and priesthood but also marked the beginning of Josh's decline. Despite internal turmoil, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel found a measure of religious stability following the downfall of the House of Omri. The worship of Baal, a divisive and destructive influence, had been eradicated from both realms. However, remnants of idolatrous practices lingered. In Judah, private altars dotted the landscape, while in the northern kingdom, Israel's God was still represented through the idolatrous symbol of a bull. Though imperfect, this period of religious reform brought a fragile peace within the two kingdoms. Externally however, both Israel and Judah faced relentless threats. Jehu, the fierce horseman who had eradicated Omri's dynasty, proved less effective against foreign enemies. Haziel, the ambitious Aramean king, launched devastating campaigns against Israel. His forces seized fortified cities, raised homes and committed brutal atrocities, sparing neither women nor children. The tribes east of the Jordan, Manasseh, Gad and Reuben, bore the brunt of Haziel's aggression, losing their lands from Bashan to the Arnon. Survivors were enslaved or subjected to horrific fates, leaving the once thriving region in ruins. Under Jehu's son, Jehoahaz, 
the situation worsened. Israel's military strength dwindled to a paltry force of 10,000 infantry, 50 cavalry, and 10 war chariots. The Arameans continued their raids, plundering and enslaving the population at will. Jehoahaz was forced to make a humiliating peace, granting Hazael's armies free passage through Israelite territory. This submission emboldened the Aramean king, who turned his attention to the Philistines, capturing Gath and setting his sights on Jerusalem. When Hazael threatened Judah, Josh chose the path of surrender. Rather than resist, he paid a hefty tribute to secure peace. This act of capitulation, coupled with other grievances, sparked widespread discontent among Judah's nobles. Their resentment culminated in a conspiracy against the king. Two courtiers, Jazakar and Jehazabad, assassinated Josh in a house where he was staying, bringing his reign to a shameful end. The deaths of Zechariah and Josh underscored the fragility of leadership built on betrayal and compromise. Both kingdoms, weakened by internal strife and foreign domination, teetered on the brink of collapse. Yet, amid the chaos, the people clung to the hope of a faithful God who would one day restore the fortunes of his chosen nation. Josh, king of Israel, eventually managed to diminish the power of the Aramean kingdom, largely due to the geopolitical dynamics surrounding him. The Hittites, based along the Euphrates and the Egyptians, threatened by Damascus's growing influence, aligned themselves against Ben-Hadad III of Damascus. This external pressure on Syria helped Josh's cause. Ben-Hadad, in an effort to weaken Israel, laid siege to Samaria, leading to extreme famine. The siege became so severe that basic food items, like the head of an ass, were sold for exorbitant prices. People were pushed to horrific extremes, with reports of women resorting to cannibalism to survive. However, the siege was unexpectedly lifted when the Aramean forces abruptly retreated, leaving behind their tents, provisions and even horses. The king of Israel, bolstered by this turn of events, fought and defeated Ben-Hadad in three separate battles, forcing him to negotiate peace. In the terms of peace, Ben-Hadad was compelled to return the towns his father, Hazael, had previously taken from Israel on the east side of the Jordan River. Nestled in the rugged heights of Mount Seir, Petra, at 4,000 feet above sea level, seemed impregnable. Edom had grown proud and defiant, declaring, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Despite this, Amaziah gathered his forces and launched a daring attack on the Edomites. A decisive battle was fought in the Salt Valley near the Dead Sea, where Amaziah's forces inflicted heavy casualties on the Edomites. Those who survived fled, leaving the fortified city of Petra vulnerable. Amaziah captured it and, for reasons unknown, renamed it Jokthal, a name that reflected Judah's influence. The victory over Edom was significant, not just militarily but economically, as Edom was a region rich in flocks and minerals. The plunder from this campaign would have bolstered Judah's resources, and Amaziah took great pride in his triumph. However, this pride eventually led to his downfall. His success stirred arrogance and an overconfidence that would bring misfortune both to him and to his kingdom. A peaceable understanding existed between Jehu and his successors in Israel and the kingdom of Judah, even if no formal alliance comparable to the earlier one between the Amrides and Jehoshaphat was established. Nevertheless, both kingdoms shared a common interest in suppressing the worship of Baal, which fostered a measure of cooperation between Jehosh of Israel and Amaziah of Judah. Both kings were devoted to the ancient law, which reflected a respect for justice and the religion of Israel. For instance, when executing judgment against the murderers of his father, Amaziah took the notable step of sparing their sons, a departure from the common brutal practice of the time. This act of mercy likely stemmed from a religious understanding that the law forbade punishing children for the sins of their fathers or vice versa. In Israel, Jehosh demonstrated great respect for the prophet Elisha, who had been instrumental in guiding the nation. When Elisha lay on his deathbed after more than 50 years of prophetic service, Jehosh visited him, lamenting his imminent passing and referring to Elisha as the father and guardian of Israel. After Elisha's death, Jehosh continued to honor the prophet's legacy. He summoned Gehazi, Elisha's trusted follower, to recount the prophet's deeds, which led to the restoration of the Shunammite woman's property. This was an extraordinary act of justice, simply based on the fact that Elisha had once been concerned with her case, demonstrating the profound personal influence the prophet held, even over the king. Elisha's influence also extended beyond Israel's borders. Naaman, a prominent Syrian general, renounced the worship of Baal and Astarte and turned to the God of Israel after being healed by Elisha. 
His conversion was so profound that he took earth from Israel back to Damascus to establish a personal altar, recognizing that the true God was worshipped in Israel. This was a significant triumph for the worship of the one true God, further solidifying Elisha's role as a spiritual leader of his time. However, despite these positive developments, the internal divisions between the two kingdoms deepened, making cooperation difficult. Amaziah, emboldened by his victory over Edom, sought to expand Judah's influence by marching against Israel. He requested the daughter of Jehoshaphat's son as a wife, likely as a political maneuver, and used Jehoshaphat's refusal as a pretext for war. Jehosh, in a sharp rebuke, compared Amaziah to a thornbush trying to claim a marriage alliance with the mighty cedar of Lebanon, mocking the pride that had swollen Amaziah's heart after his victory over Edom. Jehosh's response was not just words but action. He mustered his forces and met Amaziah's army at Beth Shemesh, where a decisive battle took place. The men of Judah suffered a significant defeat, and Amaziah was taken prisoner by Jehosh. This military confrontation marked the tragic culmination of Amaziah's pride and his failure to recognize the wisdom in Jehosh's counsel. The moderation displayed by Jehosh after his victory over Amaziah was indeed remarkable. Despite his triumph, he refrained from further exploiting his success by dethroning Amaziah, declaring the end of the house of David and absorbing Judah into Israel. Instead, Jehosh only destroyed the walls of Jerusalem and ransacked the city, the palace, and the temple, marking the first time the city was captured and partially destroyed by an Israelite king. Despite this, he set Amaziah free but demanded hostages as a guarantee. This restraint can likely be attributed to the influence of the prophet Elisha or his disciples, who may have encouraged moderation and respect for the religious and political structures of Judah. After Jehosh's death, Amaziah resumed his reign in Judah but faced difficulties, largely due to the power dynamics between the neighboring kingdoms.